Welcome to the Agency Founder Podcast. Are you ready to grow your marketing agency? We pull back the curtain to show you how real marketing agency founders struggled, built, and scaled their agencies. Practical advice, lessons learned, wins, and losses. We hold nothing back. Now your host, Jeremy Sonny. Welcome to the Agency Founder Podcast by Moonshine Marketing. Every single week, we interview successful founders of marketing agencies at different points in their journey to pass on their victories, defeats, challenges, and lessons learned to help you take your agency to new heights. This week, we're speaking with Peter Raitano of Abacus, an agency that merges creative, media, and data to scale for a mobile first world. Peter, thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and you said that before we started recording that you are up in a sunny, warm, tropical Toronto uh, area right now. Is that, <laughs> is that right? That's correct. It's actually a sunny day today, but uh, we've, we've just come out of the, the Arctic tundra phase of Canadian life. So um, yes, we're based in Toronto and the agency has an office here and uh, an office in New York international agency very cool yeah you know i would love to kind of hear uh a little bit about you know how you personally got started with you know marketing and you know kind of how you you know got started with abacus like how, what what's the kind of founding story there yeah so i mean i've been in agency start side uh marketing for 10 or so years I learned marketing. I didn't do marketing at school or anything like that. I, I actually learned, I was working for an agency doing more sales style kind of work in the UK. And I they had a, a successful kind of uh, HR product, SaaS product that I took over to Australia and was basically given the, the job of growing that by myself on a 100% commission structure. And that's when I started to tinker around with you know, SEO and PPC back in the day when SEO was keyword stuffing and hiding keywords everywhere and density and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so hacking all of that together, I kind of got my first taste of, you know, online marketing. I did that, built up the company out in Australia and then moved to Canada and um, joined an agency that I later became an owner in called Spark. And we grew that for six years. Eventually, that agency got acquired. I did an earn out and then set up uh, Abacus, uh, which is my current company with my co-founder, Jeff Goldenberg. So it's been a kind of 10-year ride. Wow, that's quite the story. So that's like that's really interesting to go from kind of the sales side to more of the founder side and, and things like that. How, how do those sort of roles compare, I guess, you know, as I think about this from, you know, kind of being in an agency, working for an agency on like the accounts side like that, if and versus like, you know, kind of running uh, an agency day to day? Yeah, I mean, I actually think sales is like a foundational skill for kind of entrepreneurship generally, you know, you need to be able to sell a vision externally. When Abacus started, we actually raised a little bit of uh, seed capital and that's, you know, all sales. And, you know, you need to be able to sell your vision internally to your staff. Um, and also when you when you start an agency and, you know, in the early stage of an agency, a lot of the selling falls on the, the founding team, the CEO or whatever, to sell clients. And I still, you know, a big part of my job still is sales and running the sales team internally. So, you know, it's it's been a common thread throughout my career, punctured with kind of learning online marketing and frankly, you know, how to run a business along the way. So, you know, finance and all of that kind of good stuff was was never something that I that I did, um, you know, at school or anything like that. It's been something that I've learned and been forced to learn throughout my kind of 10 years. That's really fascinating. So backing up a little bit, can you tell us all a little bit more about Abacus and what you all focus on and what you do and, and kind of your approach to, uh, to the marketing agency world, like what, what your unique sort of differentiator is? Yeah, so... Uh, when we started Abacus, you know, I was 
pretty keen on doing something very different to what I had before. And the, what I had before was a full service generalist kind of agency doing everything for everybody. And I, myself and my partner, we thought that wasn't the future of the agency world. We thought the future would be, you know, more specialized kind of boutique agencies that work together with other agencies in a kind of mesh network. And we thought that the old AOR model was starting to break down and didn't offer the value to clients that it that it maybe should have done um, or maybe used to. Um, you know, these people say they can do everything, but the, the truth is they really don't do a lot of the things that they need to do very well. So we thought, you know, we want to be specialized. We want to be collaborative in, in a network. And the area we, we started to specialize in right off the bat was uh, Facebook advertising. So we just wanted to be known as the Facebook people. And, and when we started, there weren't too many agencies doing just that. And we wanted to bring a kind of performance perspective to Facebook advertising. So that's what we did to start with. We only ran ads. We ran ads, you know, doing kind of CPA driven direct response uh, marketing. And then we worked with other agencies and brands to get the creative and all of that kind of stuff. But what we realized, you know, a year into it was, you know, it doesn't, we could spend millions of dollars on the platform. And what we, what we really learned was creative was um, a key drive. You can't, you know, out optimize bad creative. And we kept on getting a lot of bad creative. And what I mean by bad creative, it doesn't just mean like bad quality. It means it's not suited to the form and function of the platform. We'd work with big, you know, agencies that would produce beautiful spec commercials. And then we would get it to run on Facebook and it'd be like, hey, why don't you remix this and chop it down and then run it on Facebook? Where it just doesn't work like that. We were getting, you know, horizontal ads that uh, needed sounds that were too long be before they got to the main message. You know, a, a, a big turning point I remember is we were running a campaign for Star Wars and it was this Father's Day commercial, I Am Your Father. I Am Your Father's Day it was. And it was this beautiful, very emotional ad, really nicely done. And it played really well on um, TV and we were excited to get it. Obviously, we're all nerds and we like Star Wars, but it just fell flat on Facebook because it took... 20 seconds to realize that it was actually anything to do with Star Wars because the narrative on Facebook, that that arc that on TV that you can tell over 30 seconds was the opposite. You need to tell people what's in it for them, why they should stick around right away and then drop down that arc, you know? So uh, that was a big turning point for us. So we now a big part of our work is the creative and content side. So we, we, we still very much focus on social and, and mobile and we build out the content. We do all of the kind of uh, the, the media campaigns and the attribution. And we're, we're not full service, but we're full service within that. We do content and creative and media buying joined together. And our kind of value prop is media and creative and data all in one package. So without one of those things together, you're, you're not, you're not going to get the results that you want. That's actually really fascinating because like largely, so I guess my big question is do you still see the future as this sort of like mesh network of specialist agencies or do you think that the AOR is making a comeback or is it going to be kind of something in between? Because largely when you started off, I'm like super agreeing, right? Not that I disagree with your endpoint at all, but it, it was just interesting because I've largely had the same philosophy myself, right? It's why I only do media buying. Now, granted, I don't do just media buying for Facebook. A lot of my work is Facebook as I've been doing Facebook ads for like nine years. But I'm like, you know, largely I've been white labeling or partnering. And that's what our agency does. And I'm, I'm curious if you still think that's the perspective that is like the future. I still think the future is very different to the future that the large AOR multi, you know, national conglomerates are moving towards like it's very different to what they're in and i don't think that model is going to survive in the next 10 years that the, the incentives are all misaligned for them and they don't have the, the capabilities in-house i still think and i you can see it there are some really interesting groups emerging that provide for this kind of new reality so it, Companies like S4, um, that's Martin Sorrell's new new group. They, you know, merge companies together, but they're still kind of independent groups that work together in collaborative environments. But they're not 
stuck together in these weird acquisitions where, you know, I don't know if you've, you've seen inside of these acquisitions, but they kind of jam them together. Hey, you guys need to work together, but you've still got different P&Ls and you've, you know, one, one company's doing an earnout, so they still want to, you know, uh, to keep most of the business and they don't, they just don't work together very well. So um, I almost see like the future as some kind of, you know, record label of agencies that can come together and work together and make it easier for large companies to buy. But I, you know, I, you need specialized people to execute efficiently on all of these different types of, you know, campaigns and platforms like SEO is very different to Facebook ads. And I, I still see a kind of need for those big, deep specialisms, but having more collaboration across um, the companies that work together. Yeah, that is actually really interesting perspective. And to be honest, I haven't ever worked for like a big holding agency or anything like that. So like, I don't have the kind of like boots on the ground intel. I guess what you're describing as like a record label is how I sort of assumed it looked, or maybe that's how they've marketed themselves (laughs) to like look, but the reality is probably a little bit different. That's really interesting, though, where you see this kind of record label, could you dive into that a little bit more? So like you'd have you know, one like holding company or, you know, sort of umbrella partnership co-op thing or whatever. And then it would just be specialist under that sort of umbrella. I think there's a ton of ways of doing it. Like even now with Abacus, a big part of our business development right from the start has been Don't be, you know, overly competitive with other agencies, be friendly and collaborative. And we've got a a ton of our business from other agencies and these partnerships that we have. So because we, you know, specialize and because we, you know, plant our flag in, you know, one particular area, that means we can work with PR agencies and SEO agencies and internal marketing teams at large brands, because we're not trying to do everything and we just it makes it very easy to buy from as well so even as we you know even our outlook now abacus has that we're specialized and we work with this loose kind of network of other agencies and brands to make sure they get the you know the best value possible but you know in other models could be something like a co-op where you have a you know a, a board of directors or something like that where other agencies plug in but there's no Maybe there's no contractual obligations or something like that, but it makes it way easier to, you know, because one of the things that one of the problems with pitching big brands is they have generally have crazy procurement processes and RFP processes, and they have listed companies that can take a long time to get on on those lists. So maybe there's a there's a way for, you know, an overall company to get on those lists and, you know, bypass procurement and then make the large codes feel more comfortable because there's a quality assurance process up below it. And then underneath that, you have these agencies that can, you know, that have been vetted and, and work together really well. Because as well, you need you need agencies and people that collaborate well. Some agencies might be really good at one thing, but they also might suck at, you know, playing ball with other people. So. Yeah, no, I've often said that I'll take a B plus player over an A plus player that can work with other people because I've met you know, a lot of self-proclaimed geniuses, as it were, that, you know, are insufferable to work with. And ultimately, the the work suffers and the client outcomes suffer because of, you know, ego getting in the way, unfortunately. That's really fascinating. So, you know, you mentioned that you try and be friendly with other agencies and things like that. Is that how you kind of like run your sales process? Is that, you know, you go out and you just network and look for like kind of referral work because you specialize in kind of, you know, would it, would it be fair to say like mobile social ads, you know, and, and look to like help out with that? I, I don't know if that's a fair characterization. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Or are you like running like a more traditional sales process, you know? Yeah, so our, our sales process has evolved, obviously, as the agency has grown. So to start with, Jeff and I both had a a decent network that um, referred work into us. To start with, we would you know do a ton of speaking, thought leadership at different conferences. We would get business that way. We would go to you know I would say describe them as almost super influencers. So we would build very strong relationships with say VCs and VC portfolios who would need performance marketing for their portfolio you know, investments. So we'd get a lot of work that way and, you know, network with agencies and build referral relationships and all of that type of stuff. And then over time, we've, I think one of the things that 
you know, most people are told when they're building an agency is their founders should do the sales until you're X, Y, Z size. And that may be true, but I think also that holds people back from scaling at a certain point. Like you can't just rely on you or your network or referrals. I think, you know, there's a point of pride with a lot of people where, hey, we get all of our work from referrals and that's great, but there's only a certain point that that can scale to. I mean, if you want to scale beyond that, you're going to need some kind of sales process, sales team. So what that looks like now for us is we do a ton of inbound marketing, SEO, our own ads, webinars, especially right now, we do a lot of virtual type stuff. And then we have a, a, a dedicated sales team. So we have one salesperson that does outbound sales, very SaaS kind of uh, base. So we have you know, email marketing and a, a funnel set up and they kind of harvest that stuff. And then we have one salesperson who's more traditional agency relationship, let's take this client out to the ball game type person. Um, so we, we get both of those styles and it works really well. And I, I, I think it's one of the fallacies I, I always hear with agency world, like, sales team you can't build a, a that kind of sales team at a an agency at you know the the SaaS type um, sales function and it's it's worked for us we have a really good sales team that uh you know we can turn the spigot on and ramp up and ramp down kind of as needed and it's combined with great you know a lot of thought leadership and speaking and you know master classing and all of that kind of stuff that's really interesting. I love uh, I love kind of hearing about that. And it sounds like, you know, it's a little bit of um, I don't want to say like patchwork or anything, but like it sounds like it's a little bit of everything. Right. There is no kind of silver bullet, as it were. Would that be kind of a fair way of saying it about like agency sales processes? Yeah. And we we've, we've spent a lot of time honing it and we're, we're just lucky we have we you know, found the right team. You know, if I had to. I don't think I would bet on myself to h- continually hire great salespeople. I think we've, you know, we've probably hired six salespeople and we we now have two and they're awesome, but I don't think I'd bet on myself knowing what that looks like to make a hire. It's a very it's a hard role to hire for, I think, and um you know, it, it's a bit of trial and error. You need at least 90 days to test people out, but it's it, what we have now works really well, so and I would add, um, you know, one of the things that allowed us to sell into large clients early on, I think, was just part of our positioning and strategy. Um, so being a specialist agency that was doing something that, you know, a lot of brands recognized they weren't getting very well from the current agency relationship allowed us to get into those relationships pretty fast. Whereas if we'd have just, you know, come onto the scene and said, hey, we're another full service agency, it would have been very hard to break through the noise. So I think good positioning and uh, differentiation goes a long way, especially early on when, you know, there's a, you know, you've, you've got to break through. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's definitely a lot easier of a sell to come in and say, we do this really well. Is this a need for you versus just let us do everything right? Because that's it's, it's a little bit harder of an ask, I think. But yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. So as you sort of grown, you know, I, I'm curious what, you know, your, your sort of biggest lessons learned are positive and negative, right? Like if you could go back in time and say, do more of this, in the early days of building Abacus, and then stop doing this immediately. <laughs> what would those? What would those two things be? I would say that you know the biggest one, and I'm still learning it, and I still have trouble with it, is saying no to bad clients. You know, it's as somebody that one of my jobs is to make sure you know we we've, we've got the revenue, and I you know have my finger on the pulse of the finance of the company. It's so tempting to take money when it's presented to you but you know a bad client is like a tax on future profits and it's you need to be so careful in not taking those projects on because it's like a hamster wheel you take it on and then you need to hire more and you need more resources and it's not profitable anyway so you're almost kicking the can down the road so saying no to those kind of clients and uh projects and having a very structured approach to evaluating new projects with a kind of lead scoring system is super helpful because you can take out the overhead of having to think about this 
you know, every time that kind of mental energy, you don't need to burn all of that kind of fuel and thinking about this every time you've got this system in place where you're like, okay, no, this is, doesn't fulfill, you know, two out of three of the boxes. So we're going to take a pass on it. No, that's something that I still need to learn as well. I think that, that yeah, yeah, well, think it's, we all do. <laughs> it's, it's one thing that you hit on that, like, I think that people don't realize and like, I realize it and I still fall into the trap over and over and I probably need to systematize it a little bit better, like what you're talking about. But it's, it's not even that like, you might make no money or whatever. It's all the time wasted and mental energy wasted that could be spent finding good long term clients. You know what I mean? That's what to me sets it back so hard when you sign like a big demanding, you know, needy, whatever the problem with the client is, right? Like it's really that you're, you know, the good clients that are out there are getting snatched up by somebody else, right? Um, When you could have been using that time to find them instead. Yeah, there's all opportunity cost. For sure, for sure. The oppor- yeah, opportunity cost is is massive. Um, so so, what would you say? You know, is the biggest thing that you you would do more of that you wish you would have figured out earlier, or rather than like you know, because obviously, like you say no to more clients, but like what what like sort of positive action would you have taken earlier on if you could do it over? Yeah, I mean, when we started the agency, we were really keen on building a, a positive culture. Um, we saw the retention average in the industry is at about 25%, 30% annual. So we wanted to avoid that, uh, obviously, you know, as a, as a service business, your people are your biggest asset. And we built that in right from the start. And it's worked really well. But I would just thinking back, kind of just making sure that I'm doubling down on that all the time. And to be honest, one thing now with all of this coronavirus kind of stuff would be, you know, now we're fully remote. We've always been flexible um, work hours, but we've always had an office. And now I'm just, uh, you know, I'm talking to my co-founder and our management team. I think we could have gone fully remote a lot earlier. And that kind of the coronavirus has forced our, our hands. And I think that's the same with a lot of companies. You know, I, I saw a meme online the other day where I was like, you know, which person in your company instigated digital transformation? Was it the CEO? Was it the chief strategy officer? Or was it COVID? And you know, for most people, it's COVID that's forced people to digitally transform their company. And I think we could have gone remote a lot earlier and built out a lot of kind of the you know, efficient automation systems that we that we have now a lot sooner. And I, you know, I still think there's, you know, uh, an argument to have some kind of community small office or something like that, which we probably will do, but we don't need the flashy office downtown. I think we kind of, we thought that's what clients wanted and needed, and maybe some do, but I think we could have chopped that up a lot faster and become remote. And I think one of the things that comes out of this current crisis for us is we just want to be the best remote distributed agency we possibly can be. Yeah, that's amazing. No, I love that. And and I guess a question, right, is do you necessarily want the clients that need the big flashy office to visit, right? Is that like a good indicator, you know? Um, but no, this has been absolutely fascinating, Peter. I really appreciate your time. You know, I always give my guests a minute or two here at the end of every episode to pitch whatever you want. Um, whether it's your company or, or anything else, um, I will take a second and pitch social distancing. Keep away from each other, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, stay at home. Uh, we're we're all in it together. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and just take a minute or two and and pitch whatever you like. Cool. Well, I'll I'll double down on your social distancing and say, wear a mask, people. Even if it's just a DIY cloth mask, put that on your face. To, you know, uh, I know there's been a lot of mixed messaging out there, but I think it's pretty clear that's. Uh, something that helps. Um, you know, I don't really uh, feel I, you know, I don't want to pitch anything particular, but what I would say is I'm, I'm seeing a lot of kind of interesting content right now from the advertising community, speaking a lot about or lamenting the fact that storytelling has gone and we're over relying on uh, data and kind of we've lost that art of you know the Steve Jobs style inspirational commercial and kind of lurching back into that and I think I think that's a mistake I think you know we really need quality storytelling um, and beautiful ads but we also need to remember that context 
um, has changed and people's way of consuming content has changed. And although the biggest creative directors in the world may want to still produce 45 seconds commercials that can win a con lion, the truth is most people are consuming content, you know, uh, asynchronously uh, on their phone and you don't have 30 seconds, you have six seconds, and you may not even have sound. So we need to think about that context and how to tell stories in that context. But also we don't just want to throw, you know, data and tracking out of the window, a well-timed ad with the right story to the right person at the right time is key. So we need a combination of that, you know, technical um, data perspective, performance perspective, and also high quality storytelling. It's not one or the other. And so that's what I, I like to think that Abacus is kind of uh, working towards or trying to trying to solve for. No, that's incredible. And I, uh, I, uh, could not agree more, honestly, even as somebody that, you know, white labels and is a pure media buyer, right? Um, all marketing is content marketing, right? If you define content um, broadly enough. And I think that the context in which that content happens can tell a great story. And that's really, you know, ultimately what it comes down to, right? Um, so I, I completely agree. Well, Peter, thank you so much again. Really appreciate the uh, your time. You know, this has been an incredible episode for everybody out there listening, you know. Peter has an incredible perspective and, you know, I learned a lot. So take these lessons to heart. So thank you everybody and happy marketing.